very warm welcome to all it is a very good afternoon to all our guests joining in from the uk kenya and east africa a good evening to all our guests joining in from india and south asia and a very good morning to all our guests joining in from the us and south america today is the 12th seminar in the second edition of this <coughs> seminar series on the digital future for business and society emerging perspectives on ai blockchain and iot this seminar series has been hosted jointly by professor yogesh duvevidi who is a professor of digital marketing and innovation founding direction uh, director of the emerging markets research center and co director of research school of management swansea university wales uk and co host for the seminar series is professor ramakrishna raman director sibm pune dean faculty of management symbiosis international university and director strategy and development at symbiosis our entire seminar series is jointly supported by center for technology innovation management and enterprise time the university of kent uk digital marketing and analytics sig academy of marketing Grenoble IAE Graduate School of Management a Grenoble INP School of the University of Grenoble Alps the e business and e government SIG British Academy of Management and the UK Academy for Information Systems UKAIS to tell you something about the seminar series itself emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence blockchain and internet of things undoubtedly offer a transformative potential for the augmentation and potential replacement of human tasks and activities within a wide range of industrial intellectual and social applications the pace of change for the new ai technological age is staggering with new breakthroughs in algorithmic machine learning and autonomous decision making coupled with the developments related to blockchain and iot and generating new opportunities for continuous innovation the impact of ai and other emerging technologies could be significant with industries and sectors ranging from agricultural finance healthcare manufacturing retail supply chain logistics utilities and uh, to name a few all potentially being disrupted by the onset of these technologies the seminar series on the digital future for business and society emerging perspectives on ai blockchain and iot will present various perspectives from a number of leading expert speakers to highlight the opportunities and challenges posed by the rapid emergence of this transformative technologies today we have with us one such eminent thought leader dr john he would share his thoughts with us on the area of ai ethical biases across the data analytics pipeline to tell you something about our speaker dr john lectures in the department of information science and management science at the university of nairobi kenya and was previously a research associate at the kenya educational network kenet he holds a phd in business administration strategic information systems msc it and bed honors he is trained in scientific communication and publishing e learning course design faculty support in online course development educause and pedagogical leadership he is a certified project management professional pmp big data engineer ibm certified and artificial intelligence analyst ibm certified He is trained in supply chain resilience by Kung Logistics University Germany. He has published and reviewed for referred journals in information systems and serves as a senior editor for the Information Technology and People Journal. He is an active member of ISACA, Informs, PMI and AIS, president for East African chapter. His current research interests cut across adoption of emerging digital technologies data analytics information systems education digital platforms and it project management welcome dr john very happy to have you with us today over to you thank you sir 
Thank you very much, uh, Vimal, for that warm uh, introduction. And uh, everybody else joining us from all over the world, whichever part. I am delighted to be here to present uh, a seminar which is basically coming from uh, um, an article we recently published in the Journal of uh, Decision Systems. And uh, as Vimal has uh, rightly introduced, AI technologies are uh, transformative and uh, they are delivering uh, positive outcomes to both organizations and even individuals. But uh, accompanying all these good things about AI are also social and technical issues related to ethics. And uh, that is what my talk today is going to focus on. And this will be around AI ethical uh, biases. And AI, as we know, are uh, informed by a lot of uh, algorithms that run behind these systems. And uh, these algorithms are not very transparent to the users of these uh, technologies. And this raises a number of questions because by its very nature, these AI systems are, uh, there are certain aspects of these systems that are black boxed. And uh, sometimes you want to open this black box and see could there be certain uh, issues that may not augur well in terms of our societal aspirations. And uh, I will going to go through my presentation, maybe around 30 minutes or so. And uh, let me just share the screen kindly. Um, I, I hope everybody can see my screen. Yes, sir. And uh, yes, thank you very much. So my my yes. uh, presentation is uh, AI ethical biases across the data analytics uh, uh, pipeline. So I will just go through what I prepared systematically. And then after that, we can have an open session. So uh, merging uh, technologies, uh, with AI capabilities actually underpin the current wave of digital transformation that we see around. And digital transformation is really being uh, discussed. And uh, actually, if you just look across, there are so many calls from journals, uh, from uh, different disciplines, uh, with special issues on digital transformation. And we see that this digital transformation is highly underpinned by AI capabilities. So AI systems actually offer novel and distinctive opportunities uh, that can enable businesses to come up with new business models and even to customize their products. So AI is expected to have a major impact on the adopting organizations and the future of work, both at organizational level and also at uh, individual uh, levels. So AI technologies are being de uh, deployed in areas that include robotics, autom autonomous weapons, facial recognition, natural language processing, and virtual agents. So uh, researchers have tried uh, to come up with some kind of uh, a synchronized definition of what AI is, but it's quite broad. But we'll take that AI refers to programs, algorithms, systems, and machines that exhibit aspects of human intelligence by mimicking intelligent uh, human behavior. So the main difference between AI technologies and conventional technologies is that AI's attempt to approximate human cognitive functions to search, analyze, and make decisions basically based on big data. 
And this is taking advantage of the advanced computing capabilities um, that are emerging large storages, memories, and um, of course, huge computational power that is now available. So the increasing deployment of AI in organizations have a profound impact on the future of work with the potential to enhance productivity, promote innovation, and enhance competitive advantage by optimizing processes. But coming with all these good things is that uh, these technologies also present complex challenges to do with data, privacy, security, labor, human rights, and ethics. So most specifically, the applicability of AI has been subjected to a wide range of ethical debates, including how AI can be programmed to make moral decisions and how the processes leading to such decisions can be made more transparent to humans. So accompanying these AI technologies is the problem of uh, the fact that they cannot be scrutinized. Uh, and uh, most of uh, the algorithms driving these systems are black boxed. And therefore, there the are calls for much more transparency, especially to humans. So the risks around AI systems arise from the fact that they are not always transparent to inspection. For example, the learning algorithms at the heart of most AI applications can be misused, can be misused to tailor, optimize, and amplify inaccurate and harmful innovation, uh, information from targeting and shaping misleading adverts to creating highly realistic fake social personas. So it is imperative uh, that we think of an end-to-end -end approach to addressing these ethical issues that arise from AI. So even though these technologies are enabling managers to develop various st strategic innovations based on data analytics and other algorithmic techniques, we as researchers and practitioners, we are grappling with the many algorithmic biases emanating from training data, modeling, and sociocultural uh, sources. So it is true that it is human beings who are behind these algorithms that drive AI systems. And human beings are known to have certain biases. Could it be that these biases to be advertently or inadvertently uh, transferred to these algorithms that derive the AI systems. So understanding ethical biases that arise from extensive use of AI technologies matters to managers and policymakers since decisions made based on biased algorithms can result to unjust unfair or prejudicial treatment of people, leading basically to discrimination and marginalization. So on top of that, we know that these AI systems are developed and probably the development follows a kind of a spectrum. And we are going to borrow heavily from the information systems development uh, uh, life cycle and um, from the design to the testing to the implementation and to the application of these AI systems across that spectrum, there could be ethical biases uh, at each and every stage. So the goal of the study that we conducted was to come up with a conceptual framework that captures the various AI biases that may emanate at every stage of uh, development of these AI systems. So we conducted a narrative literature review just to identify. There are so many studies that have been conducted around algorithmic biases, <clears throat> but these studies are scattered 
and they are emanating from different uh, disciplinary orientations. Some are uh, based on philosophical approaches, some are uh, technical approaches, social approaches, and even mathematical. So uh, we read quite a number of this literature just to identify some of the biases uh, that have emerged from literature, not in any systematic way, and that is why we use the the narrative literature review. So uh, we realize that uh, system development, the information system development is a kind of uh, a socio-technical activity because there are people and there are technologies. So it is basically uh, socio-technical. So since it, it's socio-technical, we cannot isolate the development of information systems from the social and cultural context that surrounds it. So fundamental human issues such as cultural, social, political, and moral questions will always arise when you are developing information systems, including these AI-oriented uh, systems. So even though information systems development is based on methodologies, Few of these methodologies incorporate ethical dimensions into their overall development process. So this kind of gap uh, has led us to consider social responsibility while using AI and business analytics. So these considerations imply that AI developers must grapple with ethical issues because as we have said, the entire process of system development is socio-technical. There's the social part and there's also the technical part. So AI ethics is a, an emerging field that focuses on developing frameworks and guidelines to ensure the ethical use of AI in society. So though the field is still nascent, there's agreement amongst scholars and practitioners that it should address issues around bias and fairness. So the term bias generally means deviation from, uh, from, the, from the norm or from the standard. And uh, that deviation sometimes may be seen in negative connotation. But uh, we can think of AI bias as an instance where the design, testing, implementation, validation, and the application of an AI technology amplifies existing inequities in society. So we can classify AI ethical biases into human factors that cause ethical risks, features of AI that give rise to ethical problems and training of AI systems to be ethical. So we can look at this in terms of human factors and uh, technology factors uh, that may give rise to ethical problems. So we attend this goal, of course, by identifying the various biases. And then from those biases, we used the cross industry standard process for data mining because it, it is a generic model that can be used to identify the various stages through which you can develop an AI system. And uh, we took this approach because uh, CRISP is considered to be the de facto industry agnostic standard for understanding data mining projects. So we, we used CRISP for two reasons, because it's an hybrid model whose faces resemble that of a generic system development life cycle. And it infuses data mining techniques with the traditional uh, system development life cycle. Two, we also used it because of the fact that a bias can occur at any stage of the design, development and deployment process. So that's why we are talking of an end to end, from the beginning to the end. 
where are the points where biases can emanate and how can those biases be addressed? So we identified uh, three big areas of biases from the literature as in the table shown. So we identified the data biases. the method biases and the implementation biases. So examples of uh, data biases would include uh, historical bias. Uh, probably when we are designing um, AI systems or uh, data analytics, sometimes we use historical data and probably this historical data may not present uh, a picture that uh, is uh, relevant today or uh, in the current context. So there's also the representation bias. This has more of uh, to do with the kind of data that we have picked to use in training um, the algorithms or uh, in validating the algorithms and the measurement bias, selection bias and label bias. So we identified also aggregation bias, learning bias. Some of these are repeated across the stages because we thought they just recur. So it can happen in the stage of data understanding or preprocessing, and it can still occur when you are uh, uh, modeling or when you are testing the, the algorithm. So after identifying uh, these biases, we used the CRISP model to see at what stage within the development process or within the analytics process would this kind of biases emerge. And uh, <clears throat> this is the conceptual model that uh, we developed and uh, this was actually the main output of the study. So on top there, we have the various stages of uh, a data analytics uh, cycle. So we have uh, the business understanding, the data understanding and data prepar preparation. What some people, the three stages, some people will call data preprocessing. And then uh, we have uh, modeling. Um, the algorithms and then evaluation, and then of course, deployment. So we thought of the first two stages as being data generation, and then uh, the other stages falling in model building and implementation. Uh, so we tried uh, to place the various uh, uh, biases in terms of uh, where they fall within the CRISP model. And um, this is quite exploratory and uh, many suggestions can still come in into how to improve this uh, framework. So we still have the data biases, the method biases and the implementation uh, biases. So we thought that the data biases probably fall heavily at the data generation stage or the data pre-processing stage. And then the method biases and the implementation biases mainly at the modeling stage and also at the implementation stage. So the model uh, had, uh, of course, uh, uh, four parts, the crisp the stages, then the scope of the biases, which we divided mainly into three with the examples listed there. Uh, and then the uh, practical examples. So in the data biases, you can have an equal treatment or objectification based on demographic uh, uh, differences. In the method biases, you can have, uh, these are just typical examples we got from literature correlation fallacy that confuses correlation with causation. And uh, implementation biases, an example to be discre uh, decreased user satisfaction due to certain content, getting good ranking by a rating algorithm based on a repeated number of clicks. Now, 
more importantly, we also thought then, how do you address some of these biases as they emerge from the stages? So we broadly thought of the solution in terms of normative uh, approach and the software development approach. So the no normative approach probably is what ought to be or uh, uh, decisions that can be taken to make uh, this uh, or to de de bias or to reduce uh, these biases, not from a technological point of view, but from an ethical point of view, more or less using moral principles. Then the software development approach basically focused on uh, technology. Some of the some of these are mathematical. Some of these are software engineering oriented. So, in terms of a normative approach, we thought of one that. Um, as we develop uh, these AI systems, we should conduct ethical impact assessment um, on these uh, systems. We should uh, be able to come up with frameworks that can enable us to do some kind of ethical analysis. What are some of uh, these biases and how can they be addressed from a totally ethical point of view? Then, uh, do not disguise AI systems as humans. We also feel that from an ethical point of view, we should not make uh, these AI systems confuse or make people believe that they are actually humans. So if it is a bot, a chatbot, for example, then let the user know that this is not a real person, but it is an AI system. So we think that from a moral perspective, uh, AI systems should uh, not um, masquerade, so to speak, to be human beings. And uh, also to limit AI in, uh, in political uh, uh, processes. The, the political processes are always quite emotion, emotional processes. There are a lot of stake. And probably we've had cases where AI-oriented systems have been used in political processes. Uh, we think that from an ethical point of view, that should be avoided. Then uh, sc scalable uh, supervision of uh, these systems. So these systems should operate in a way that in as much as they can learn, then this learning should not be allowed to go to the extent which are considered safe, which are considered unsafe and without supervision. So in as much as these systems learn from the happenings in the environment, there should be very close supervision by actual human persons. And many other more, these are just examples that we picked for this model. So that stage just deals with the uh, approaches that can be taken from an ethical point of view to reduce or minimize these biases. So from a software development uh, perspective, we think that AI system performance should always be evaluated from time to time to see if these systems are performing within their expectations and uh, there are no biases that have been introduced in their performance. And also to, uh, these systems should be prevented from self-modification. Uh, Since they are able to learn, they could also be imbued with capability to modify their states depending on what they have learned but we are saying that uh, this should be avoided and this self-modification should ha only happen with human supervision. So we also have to constantly monitor the rewards that are programmed in these AI systems in terms of uh, what they learn uh, with the aim of improving their 
performance. So uh, you want to uh, avoid a situation where this reward system is gamed and then um, the system ends up uh, going beyond what is expected. And then, of course, simulation before implementation, uh, constraint uh, reinforcement learning, and cooperative inverse reinforce uh, uh, learning. So these are some of the solutions suggested in this uh, framework. And uh, as you can see, this is just an emerging framework, still a lot of room to improve it. Uh, so that it's more holistic and uh, exhaustive. So uh, in uh, conclusion, sorry for that typo the end at the end there. We have seen in recent years that uh, ethics of algorithms have become a silent topic of discussion amongst scholars, technology vendors, software developers and policymakers. And uh, from my reading, I see all this coming uh, from philosophy of technology, um, uh, from social sciences, and therefore this topic is being approached from different uh, disciplinary or orientations. And that can enrich it, but can also con cause a, a lot of confusion especially for us in information systems. So this study contributed to the debate by attempting to identify and classify AI ethical biases into a high level conceptual framework, basically capturing the biases, examples, and uh, some uh, solutions to address these biases. So the framework demonstrates a systematic approach of understanding and addressing AI ethical biases across the system development spectrum. It extends uh, conceptual frameworks that already exist uh, in the literature, like that of Shures and Gutag, Actel and Fasse. So additionally, the conceptual uh, artifact that uh, we proposed can act as a formalized system that provides a source of stability for theorizing and conceptualization of the antecedents of ethical biases across the ISD process. So as these technologies, the AI technologies continue to develop and pervade our life, such a framework can assist practitioners to identify these bi uh, biases at every stage of development. But more importantly, this gives a typology that provides a kind of uh, communication, a unified way of communicating these biases. So, so in summary, uh, as I say, the, the framework is work in progress and uh, we hope that it can be enriched so that it covers all the areas of uh, ethical biases especially related to ai systems and uh, i think that brings me to the end of the presentation thank you very much thank you very much for uh, sharing this insightful session sir just have a couple of questions would you like to address that Hello, sir. Yeah. Yes. Uh, sir, we have got one question. Uh, with businesses depending more and more on AI, is it a shift from uh, human bias and prejudice to AI bias and prejudice? Probably you come again so that... Okay. Uh, sir, the question is... As businesses are depending more and more on artificial intelligence, is it that we are shifting from the biases and prejudices that we as humans had to the biases and prejudices for AI? Okay. The, the thing is that these AI systems are developed by us human beings. 
And uh, when, as human beings, we already have biases, then we can carry those biases to the systems uh, knowingly or uh, unknowingly. So, and we say that most of these systems, as we develop them, they are socio-technical. They combine the social and the technical. And uh, our social nature is that uh, these biases, we do have them, and it's possible to carry them as we develop these systems. So I, I, I think that's the way I, I look at it, uh, that we are just carrying what we already have into the systems that we develop. Technologies are not neutral. Okay. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, John, um, thank you so much for your talk today. And I'm sorry I joined a little later. Um, it was, uh, your conceptual model was very comprehensive. I mean, you, you nicely presented three stages, uh, three different um, Yogesh, Yogesh, you are not very clear. I don't know whether... Oh, okay. Yes, okay. Are not clear? Yes, a bit, of, a bit of improvement now. Okay. Yes. No idea why, why it is, but I'll try. So I was just saying that um, your conceptual model is very comprehensive. I mean, it's very nicely you have put three categories of... Um, uh, biases and three stages and then three categories of biases and how to how to uh, actually overcome those biases uh, or avoid those biases. So that's very comprehensive. Just uh, obviously, uh, I know Bimal will be asking uh, another question, but um, before proceeding, uh, obviously AI is a reflection of human being. So whatever we are, as you rightly said, whatever we are, our, our biases, our fairness, our whatever we have will be filtered into the AI system. Um, so how can we actually, how can we avoid or at least make things uh, uh, more fair by, by having more balance in design team? What are your, your recommendations for that, uh, John? Is John is here? I think he's gone. Maybe disconnected. There might be some connection issues. Yeah, seems like. I think John is disconnected, so. Participants, let us wait for a couple of minutes. I think yeah. Dr. John think would uh, join back. Yeah. Yeah, maybe uh, Annabelle has asked questions. So um, yes, uh, Annabelle, obviously your your uh, your response will come from John, but uh, this was yes. precisely my my concern as well, right? What <laughs> exactly. I that's you what know, I said. Uh, While we wait for John, maybe we can start uh, preparing the question in a way that <laughs> <laughs> he will respond when he comes back. Yeah, because it's exactly my, my question about it is uh, good that he has already identified from the current uh, literature what are the bias that we already know are happening in, uh, in different contexts, in different systems, and at different stages of the projects. However, uh, I, I think that it is essential now that we start um, reflecting on how we can actually start analyzing all these unintended consequences, even mm -hmm. before we start developing any of those projects. Because if we don't, if we, start analyzing the the harm that these systems are doing after deploying them well we are already very late and sometimes you cannot stop those things from getting embedded in our uh, society so that's that was the reason of my question yeah yeah no no that's um that's very appropriate and john is back on uh, uh, in very timely manner john you are on mute yeah Sorry, technology, technology, it disappears when you need no it problem. most. <laughs> yeah, so maybe, maybe Bimal, you can just read out um, uh, Annabelle's question, or Annabelle can just ask 
by herself. Yeah, Enabel, you go ahead. Ma'am, would you like to read me or uh, how would you prefer? I, I can just rephrase yeah, the sure, question if sure. you prefer. Yeah. So um, thank you very much, John, for your presentation. It was lovely. And, and actually, uh, when you were presenting, I was just thinking about, oh, so good that you have already identified all these biases on literature review, because in the previous work, we can start learning about how artificial intelligence is impacting not only businesses, but society in more broadly. So my question is about uh, how actually we can start discussing those ethical issues before we uh, uh, start even a project. So you were to, uh, in your framework, you have something about an ethical assessment. So I, I was just thinking, oh, how would you suggest that we can do this ethical assessment before we start the project? So we can um, anticipate harms and maybe even decide, you know what, let's not go that way because it's not gonna be good, okay? so. What are your views on that? Yeah, thank you very much, Annabelle. Actually, mm, it's, it's important, I think, uh, that as we develop uh, these systems, we work with the ethical committees, probably within the universities or within the projects. But I, I don't know, I think this is still quite a gray area because ethics is also quite an, a discipline by itself. And... Um, I think in technology, we, we are trying to see how we can also understand uh, ethics in a better way so that we can also apply them. In our, but probably we could think of multidisciplinary teams as we develop our projects so that we can bring these skills together and probably develop a kind of uh, just a guideline that you can use to to check. I think this is an area we still need to think more deeply about. Uh, especially when we want to do these AI projects. But uh, anybody else can also give suggestions on how we can go about it. No suggestion, but I definitely have uh, some remark. Um, obviously, uh, and I will, some are intended and some are unintended consequences. Yeah. Uh, and uh, unintended consequences, doesn't matter how much we will try, uh, you cannot avoid fully. So there will be something. Uh, and however, as you said that, definitely having these um, ethics framework, ethical framework, uh, and uh, basically having this agreement on most important component of ethics. So bias, transparency, and all those kind of things. Um, and then embedding that in design principle, design uh, process, uh, would obviously help to avoid some of these issues. Uh, but this is one of those things until you experience it, you would not know, you know? Uh, so maybe obviously improvement by, with, with the evolution of AI and, uh, and that's similar to any other technology. If you look at even our, most of the internet technology, they improved over time, right? Mm -hmm. Only thing that they didn't have, they didn't have actually ability to harm people directly. Uh, and AI has, AI has, you, you very rightly said another. Um, and this is why we need to be really little more vigilant and careful uh, because lots of our behavior, as you rightly said, are already changing without us knowing that, that Actually, it is happening due to AI. Uh, be it, um, you know, booking ticket, uh, you know, watching which movie, or um, you know, uh, what what you want to read, and lots of other things. Mm -hmm. All these things are changing. Our behavioral changes are happening because of uh, algorithmic algorithmic recommendations uh, and our consumption behavior aligning to it. Uh, so. I guess, yeah. you know, this can, Yes, I, I think that's very interesting because um, when you were uh, putting the, the Chris model, 
it, it, the first stage of that model is actually business understanding. And that's yes. where we are having a lot of issues because sometimes, as always in, in information systems, systems have been delegated to be designed by a team of expert people. Mm -hmm. But you, John, said very w uh, well that multidisciplinary teams more than ever are needed now into yes. how we are going to start having a business that involves all the stakeholders to understand the implications of running whatever project they are going to implement. So that that's that will be my my view as well. So I agree with you. At the beginning of the project, you need to in, in, um, really get the business to understand the whole business, not just the technical people, but the whole business. And the other aspect is even we know that it's impossible to... Uh, prevent all the unintended consequences, some of those uh, unintended consequences are very obvious. It's just like people haven't discussed about them. And that's why it's so important that in the initial stages, you discuss them. Some of them, as you did in your literature review, they, they are there. We know they are happening. So if we know that and we discuss that in the context of the new project, then it is more probably that you will prevent the harms and you will design your systems taking in consideration that you prevent as much as you can. While I understand it's impossible to be 100% risk-free, but you can prevent as much as possible. So that was my thinking around, okay, how we can do it. But I agree, multidisciplinary teams and my view at the very beginning of the project. So thank you, John. So just a little more, a few points related to it, given that we, we, we are very like little, small team or John disappeared. The, the one thing is uh, in our multidisciplinary team, obviously that's more like, uh, are we saying about research projects or are we saying actually design projects uh, for multidisciplinary team? Uh, yeah. Well, I um, I think that's one of the, the issues. Sometimes we see information systems uh, as a information system problem, and it's not an information system problem. It's a business problem that is in the yeah. context of society. So with those teams of uh, people developing the systems nowadays, it is it's very important to start introducing different um, disciplines from the very beginning because otherwise yeah. that's why that's why i think at the uh, at the moment we are having all these issues about how systems have evolved very quickly impacting our lives and we never foreseen or consider the impact for example social media well 10 years ago everybody was just exciting about the social media happening and nowadays we are seeing how the the harms and the benefits are really Sometimes you cannot distinguish which one is better or which one has better weight. And you were mentioning, John, in your presentation, something about the fake information that is generated and distributed. Or we don't know, for example, the influence of um, digital influencers in social media. But we are very happy to use them. And in marketing, we are using a lot of technologies that are shaping the views of young generations. And that is very dangerous as well, especially with all the health issues, mental health issues that we are having now, we should have learned. And it seems like we are not doing enough to prevent that again. Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, sorry, John, um, just to say that, um, I mean, one thing is obviously multidisciplinary, definitely, within the research projects, as well as if possible, within the uh, AI development projects as well. Now, other thing is actually the balance between different, example, gender balance, not just the disciplinary issue. If you really want to uh, want uh, AI to be free of biases, you really need to have uh, representation from different uh, segments. So gender balance, racial balance, you know, you, you, you won't be able to Absolutely. think of an AI system that is fair in terms of uh, race and gender if, if only one type of people are designing it. 
Um, so those balances also need to be uh, in place. And, and moreover, there need to be balance in the data. So the data that be, been, uh, been inputted to train the AI system, that data need to come from uh, different sources, uh, which should have uh, details about different dimensions of a particular uh, type of uh, things. So then, then perhaps we can, we can avoid some of the obvious issues that we are encountering in, um, in AI. John, throw it now. Yes, yes, that, that's a very beautiful discussion. Yeah, in fact, uh, what you are also thinking about uh, this site is that um, we, we are seeing more and more postgraduate uh, project studies that are involving AI collecting data and uh, all that or scrapping data from the web. And um, we, we realize that even our ethical committees within the universities are not yet very prepared to identify this from the students work and advice accordingly. So what we are thinking, because we are seeing a lot of these AI oriented studies, even in our, in our, with our postgraduate students, then how do we also empower the, the ethical committees within our universities to be able to also understand uh, this, especially when dealing with these areas of, uh, uh, projects that are AI oriented. And then uh, I think we also need to, to, to see things to do with social biases, political biases, and all sorts of biases have been heavily studied in other disciplines. Probably we could also borrow from those intellectual resources and uh, see how we can use them in, uh, in, in our own discipline to help us address some of these issues. I know philosophers have talked about this, political philosophy, they do a lot of this, and there are, there are those intellectual resources, we could, uh, we could reuse them without necessarily re reinventing the, the wheel. Yeah. In the lines of uh, the initial discussion and uh, the answer and the discussion, uh, I have one more question. Uh, See, the question is, uh, with the astonishing growth in the use of AI for analytics, is there a need to regulate AI and look into the ethical side? And if so, uh, how can we do that? Wow. <laughs> regulation, regulation, regulation. <laughs> I think it's just yes. an extension of the question because we were talking about, you know, uh, regulatory bodies in the universities or the research bodies who might be, you know, really looking into the ethics side. So maybe yes. as an extension, if it is possible to create a body which looks into the ethical side of AI and make sure that it's, it does not end up harming, as Annabelle was saying, that there is a need to establish the safety before the really process harms us. Yes, the question is who, who, who is going to be the regulator here? And uh, if you talk of government, probably it will be one of the culprits in terms of misuse of data <laughs> for political uh, reasons. So it could be a good idea, but uh, I think it's a two-edged two sword. Uh, because, uh, of course, there is, to what extent would this kind of regulations also impede innovation? Uh, and, um, of course, the big elephant in the room is who is this, who is going to regulate? To what extent do we trust the regulator in the first place? So those, those are the questions that we may probably want to ask. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Annabelle, uh, ma'am, you want to say something? Yeah, yes, thank you. Uh, actually, uh, that, that's a very good uh, discussion and it, it is um, the never ending question, who is gonna be controlling all this or regulating? And uh, there is, I just find out that there is um, a digital regulation cooperation forum here in the UK that is actually trying to uh, coordinate work from different uh, bodies of, of um enforcements and that is a good approach actually because then 
uh, for businesses that have to comply with regulations, then it gets very confused. If we have several regulations and you have to comply with all of them, then how on earth you are going to start putting all this together in a way that is not highly costly for businesses? Because sometimes if your regulations are just so complicated that just businesses will just ignore them and wait for the fine to come and that's it. So that is happening a lot with the GDPR um, uh, regulation. So those corporations and yeah, the, the ICO is leading a lot of these um, corporations. So it will be interest if you are interested, they have a lot of resources about uh, how to start uh, complying and cooperating with different bodies in order to implement um, and facilitate businesses. Actually, they have a lot of resources for and, and funding to help businesses to comply with those regulations in a more, um, yes, uh, easy way. So yeah, that comment. Let me just uh, add a few bits into it. That of course, regulation is important, Primal, without a doubt. Um, sure. And at certain level, different countries are trying to obviously come up with framework or this and that. But that's also has started happening. But what one point we want to say is we cannot, I mean, for AI, like, uh, regu regulatory aspect cannot be left on private sector at all because the implication of this likely to be for whole society. So you can't leave it to private organization, commercial organization, to do whatever they want to do. So definitely some level of control and regulation is needed from government. Now, different government, as, as John said, that it is actually a kind of a contradiction. So between um, innovation and obviously safety, security, and other aspects. Uh, if you regulate too much, basically you will kill the, uh, uh, the innovation. Now, different country can take different approach on this. One country might take hard, you know, hard uh, uh, side of it and regulate it well, but other country might, you know, give the free hand and their organization, their uh, uh, private sector will flourish with the innovation. Now, that is the problem because None of, none of these countries coming forward for this reason that it's like, first me or first you? No, first you, first you, first you. Nobody want to come as a, a, come, come as a first person to do something, uh, actually. You know? and, and especially the country that has huge, uh, for example, Silicon Valley, you know, US, US should be leading it, you know, where actually lots of the developments are happening. Most of the AI-based systems are emerging there. So one would assume that, you know, they should be the first one to come up with certain types, certain frameworks, certain uh, regulatory principles that what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. But we are yet to see it. We, we haven't seen anything like that. And uh, let's hope that because it's really important area. Regulation is very, very important. And let's hope that something will happen in the near future. I also feel that there is need to somehow, in this particular area, in all, in all the research is important, but in this particular area, it's very important to bridge the gap between academia uh, and practice. Because we can be a little independent in our approaches and our, our um, uh, findings. And if that can be taken by uh, industry, then hopefully, some, some uh, informed decision they can make uh, in that way. But these are all hopes. Let's see how it goes. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I'll, yes. I'll give a practical example here, here in Kenya, how, how it is likely to go in where I come from. Recently, the gov uh, some parliamentarians decided to introduce an ICT practitioners bill here in Kenya. The idea was to control the sector or regulate the sector, certify you to practice in the ICT field. 
Now, the, the bill went through the various stages and uh, the parliamentarians passed it. But there was an outcry from the public that uh, some of our best young developers may not have degrees in computer science or uh, in which specific field, and this will kill innovation. And uh, there was noise all over from the industry and even from the academia that this is a highly innovative area of uh, leave people to innovate. And uh, so the president actually got scared from accenting to the bill and it was taken back to parliament. So that can give us a clue here. We already know what to expect. <laughs> uh, yeah, because there are, there are many startups. The bill was trying to, they say, is going to stifle innovation, especially from young people who are starting their small startups, developing systems here and there. And the bill was saying you must have this kind of academic qualification before you can be certified to practice in the sector. Uh, yes, yeah, so that was an element of regulation and we have had a taste of it. So after the too much noise, uh, it was not uh, approved. <laughs> yeah. All right, that's an insight. Uh, yes, Annabel, madam, would you like to say something, add something? Yes, uh, I, I'm a very good example, uh, John. And actually, one of the biggest challenges is that the legislation goes slower than the progress uh, that is happening in technology. So while they catch up, there are so many things going on. But then the other problem that we are having as well is that uh, the legislation is happening in different ways in different countries with different interests. And that is the challenge for many organizations, small and large businesses that are operating across different countries, they are facing these problems as well. And then they are complying in one country, but they, their solution or they cannot make do business with others because they have different regulations. So it is getting very complicated, but as Jogesh was saying, this is something that goes beyond our own um, a context and even our own country, because we need to look into how this is interacting. And the problem with artificial intelligence systems is that they spread very quickly because they, the efficiency, the benefits they are promising, yes, they are very attractive, but we're still very, very behind in how to actually make sure that in the moment that you introduce your system in a different society, in a different country, how that system is not having a lot of bias now in the new context. Because maybe in my context, it didn't have those biases, but we introduced the system in another one and then the bias are there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, very interesting uh, point. And thank you for mentioning the Kenyan example that is in many other countries without, with very little regulation, that is what is happening. Yeah. So it seems that there might be also a need to study what are the different biases existing in different uh, cultures or regions or maybe even countries. And accordingly, it seems that as rightly mentioned by Professor Dwivedi, it has to come from the developed countries probably. They should take the first step. And accordingly, you know, uh, might be we will end up reaching at a certain balance wherein there is a scope for growth to everyone including you know small entrepreneurs who wish to start their journey and there is also a scope for the society to have an ethical side on on them the ai story is very similar to climate changes right oh <laughs> all countries are, are saying it's important it's very important you need to do something about it but nobody doing anything nobody doing anything. That is the challenge. And, and that's what exactly I see in AI. All, all now acknowledging that it's important. It's very important. It, it can be damaging. It can actually uh, harm society and everything, but nobody doing anything to, to deal with it. So let's see. Let's, let's hope for the best. 
and and be as a researcher keep researching and keep talking about it someone ho and hope someone will listen <laughs> one day you know so yeah that's all i think um, it's uh, two or six i have to go bimal okay? yes sir sure so john thank you so much accepting our invitation and and giving this talk it's so nice uh, yes i also want to thank you very much yogesh before you leave uh, for extending the invitation to me after seeing the paper i think uh, online and uh, probably we'll also extend a hand of invitation from this side sir. yes sir thank i you. just have to uh, thank you and i would like to take this opportunity to thank professor yogesh tivedi sir you've been a support you have always been guiding and looking forward to your continuous support and guidance sir so thank you so much that, for joining in and sharing lot of insights with us sir just to make a note that this was the last talk for this series the series. second series so this been running for 24 months now oh. actually mm -hmm. so it's been quite long uh, you know stretch that we have uh, we have hosted several you know initially we used to host every week actually uh, and then we thought okay it's too much <laughs> so, <laughs> so then during second series we we went uh, obviously monthly uh, seminar okay. so um, this is the end of second one hopefully let's see we might we might continue as a as a third series who knows looking forward and eagerly waiting for the third series to begin so <laughs> let's see thank you so much sir, once you. again thank you so much sir thank you thank you Bye. thank you very much i would also mohammad thank you thank you fakar Thank you, Dr. John, for sharing a wonderful presentation on insights on ethical biases and taking us through the framework. Thank you for taking out uh, time of your busy schedule, and thank you so much for sharing valuable insights with all of us. Thank you so much, participants, and once again, thank you, Dr. John. Thank you, Annabel. Everybody, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Hope to see you soon. Hope to see you soon, sir. Thank you so much. Yes.